Hi everyone, welcome to the Tesla Economist. Please hit the thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. In this video, we'll go over Porter's Five Forces model and relate it to Tesla in the automotive industry and EV market. Michael Porter is a famous academic in the fields of business and economics. He used to lecture at Harvard Business School. He enjoyed the study of competitive strategies and advantages and is best known for Porter's Five Forces framework, which is a method of analyzing the competition of a business. So let's go through each of five, the five forces and see how they relate to Tesla. The first force we'll start with is the threat of new entrants. In the automotive industry, there are massive barriers to entry. It's incredibly tough. The sheer size of these businesses, not just in market cap value, but the actual capital value in the factories, is just too big to consider entering. Unless you can niche into a product that's very expensive, still carries a good margin, and people are willing to pay for. This is exactly what Tesla did with their initial Roadster, and it cost around $100,000 back in 2006, which was a lot of money, particularly back then. It did, however, manage zero to 100 kilometers an hour in under four seconds, which back then was impressive. And they only made about 2,500 of them too. So it didn't require a big factory with lots of expensive machinery. And the cars still had their held their price around $60,000 a day, and I'll bet they go up in value in the future. So anyway, picking a specialist niche of a sports car EV was enough for Tesla to break through the barrier of entry into the automotive industry. Elon said he's not a fan of the old traditional build a moat business that value investors like Warren Buffett love so much. For example, a railway company, it's pretty hard to compete by laying down your own track. That is considered a moat. Moving forward today, Tesla's created their own barriers to entry for the EV industry. Their technology is superior to all the competition that they just can't reach close to the range that Tesla can produce. So Tesla have created a technological barrier to entry. They also have the FSD too. When Tesla make a car, they plan on running with it forever, supposedly, just making continual updates and tweaks. Although we will soon know how extreme some of these changes will be when we see the new Model S and X updates. But there's a good chance the overall shape of the car will remain the same. Why? Supply side economics. It means Tesla can make substantial investments in production equipment that may not be feasible for the competition, as their car design might only last five years, and then they may have to change a lot of the equipment. But if Tesla's will last indefinitely, and they plan on selling tens of millions of the same car, then they can invest in things like the gigapresses. So as Tesla sells so many cars of the same design, they can afford, afford to invest more on the manufacturing process. In addition to that, they can keep tweaking the same manufacturing line the whole time, continually making improvements, making the same car. And Elon says it's all about manufacturing if you want to be the best, or the machine that makes the machine. Okay, he's really talking about getting the manufacturing costs down, not so much the gaps in the door panels perhaps, but they are working on that too, and now have cameras on the production line to inspect the quality. Tesla also have demand side economics playing for them too. This is when you buy your Tesla and then have to show all your neighbors, friends, and family how amazing it is, and you let them drive it and try it out. This occurs when a buyer's willingness to purchase a particular product or service increases with other people's willingness to purchase it. This is known as the network effect. It takes an enormous amount of capital to start producing EVs to scale that Tesla have. Yet, we're seeing a few try, like NEO. They aren't close to Tesla yet, but some firms are able to raise enough capital to get their fleet feet in the door. However, incumbent automakers do have this level of capital and they have the capital equipment for their job already. So this is not really a barrier of entry for competing against Tesla. And we are seeing the legacy manufacturers slowly bring their EVs to market. Because Tesla had a first mover advantage for such a long time, they were able to secure, to secure all the best charging spots in the world for their supercharger network. Even if other EVs were ready to scale, then they still need the batteries. There simply aren't enough to go around for everyone to have an EV yet. Tesla have secured their supply chain for batteries, right back to the minerals in the ground. That too is also a huge cost for any other company to endure. It looks like the other battery companies are doing what they can to ramp up though. Tesla is their biggest customer as well. Tesla want to make as many batteries as they can, but also consume batteries from all other manufacturers as well. They just need so many batteries. Governments are also helping Tesla over the legacy internal combustion manufacturers. They're helping with tax incentives to buy an EV. Some countries and states even plan on banning the sale of internal combustion cars. This is all for the benefit of Tesla over the incumbent automakers. 
Is there a significant cost to the consumer of changing their old car to a Tesla? Slightly, perhaps. It's always a hassle trying to sell a car, but easy enough to accomplish. Some consumers may be locked in in a lease or finance, which would have a penalty, perhaps, if you need to end them early. Aside from that, it's pretty easy to change over from to a new car. The next force is the threat of substitutes. So again, this was what Tesla offered the internal combustion buyers when they launched the Roadster, a substitute product. Run your car on electricity instead of gasoline, a substitute for having to go to the gas station. And now Tesla is the preferred substitute to internal combustion cars. But what about other substitutes that threaten Tesla? Well, there's public transportation, there are ride-sharing companies like Uber and Lyft, which make life much easier to not even own a car now for some people. On the other hand, an even better substitute for that is on the way, which is the robo-taxi, significantly reducing all the costs of such an industry. The main costs are the driver and the fuel of the, and the depreciation of the vehicle. Robo-taxis use no driver, no fuel, and they depreciate very little. Teleportation might be a decent substitute, but at this stage, I think we're still a few years away from that. However, there are other factors that substitute a reason to go somewhere, particularly with the pandemic, more people are working from home and shopping online, it might actually reduce demand for travel anyway. And the likes of the Hyperloop are more in competition with planes and trains, not really competing with Tesla so much. The next force is how much bargaining power do the customers have? With very little substitutes and nothing close to the same value offering at the same price, Tesla sells every car they make and have no sort of demand problem. As it's such a coveted product, buyers don't really have any buying power. Luckily for them, Elon is doing what he can to get the prices down despite this. Having more options to buy or competition does give the consumers more bargaining power and thus competition reduces prices. This is how capitalism works. It's best for the consumer. When competition have to cut their prices and increase their offerings to stay competitive. A lot of people think this will eventually happen to Tesla that their margins of nearly 30% can't sustain because the competition is coming. But instead of Tesla cutting margins, they just innovate further and cut costs. However, this might have been a little bit different for the semi-trucks. Back in 2017, when PepsiCo ordered 100 Tesla semi-trucks, ordering on that scale and that early, the chances are Tesla probably gave PepsiCo some sort of deal. Remember, Tesla wasn't as strong back then either. In the future though, I'm not sure if Tesla will need to give discounts even if Walmart wanted a thousand semi-trucks. Why would Tesla need to give them a discount? They are the ones offering the electric truck. They are offering a huge saving for any business that purchases a semi-truck. The favor is that they get to order. In fact, some businesses have likely done the numbers and are aware of the cost savings the semi can offer them. And therefore more, more desperate to order the semi and might try and offer a premium to get earlier delivery. The next force is the power of suppliers. When Tesla was smaller, it's harder to get a good discount on parts, especially for an automotive startup that is likely to fail. This doesn't give you much leverage, as the suppliers are also concerned you may go under and not be able to pay your bills for your parts. Due to the extra risk, they charge more. Due to Tesla being small back then, the suppliers weren't that bothered if they won or lost Tesla as a customer, as they weren't providing that much in the way of business due to their low level of production. But as we move on, Tesla is larger and more vertically integrated. The vertical integration meant that Tesla supplies were more component-based rather than fully built technology. It's much easier to negotiate for simple components over pre-assembled parts as they're easier to supply. You don't want to be at the mercy of your suppliers. This is going to be the problem for all other EVs when it comes to batteries and likely the FSD technology too. Tesla's FSD is proprietary to them and they can source their own batteries. Tesla does everything they can to give their suppliers as little bargaining power as possible by integrating as much as they can themselves. In Tesla's 10Q form for the SEC for the quarter ending September 30, 2020, there's a section called Supply Risk. We are dependent on our suppliers, the majority of which are single source suppliers, and the inability of these suppliers to deliver necessary components of our products in a timely manner at prices, quality levels, and volumes acceptable to us, or our inability to inefficiently manage these components from these suppliers could have a material adverse effect on our business, prospects, financial condition, and operating results. So some of Tesla suppliers are single source suppliers. There is no alternative or substitute possibly. However, I'm sure these suppliers are delighted to be working with Tesla and doing everything they can to meet their supply chain. And it's likely Tesla are working on their own substitutes too. 
but it would likely be the same, if not worse, for any of the competition too. Cornelius Vanderbilt was the railroad tycoon in the 19th century. John D. Rockefeller would use Vanderbilt's rail to distribute his standard oil, but Vanderbilt ran the monopoly and decided to price gouge standard oil as he saw how much bargaining power he had over Rockefeller. Rockefeller was not an idiot though. He found himself a substitute and thus came the invention of the oil pipeline. The forces all lead up to the fifth and final one, rivalry among the competition. The more competition there are, the more it affects the company's profit. The competition are the legacy automakers. No, not the other EVs. They account for such a small proportion of auto sales. Tesla's not trying to compete against them. The EV industry is growing fast enough. They don't need to compete so much against each other, or at least Tesla doesn't need to. No, Tesla is targeting the other 97% of auto sales, and Tesla has differentiated themselves well in the market, essentially coming up with cars that are not only so much better, but also cheaper to own, along with being better for the environment. But what if the legacy automakers could actually deliver a decent number of EVs to compete, and they would do it in the only way they know how? marketing, likely through lots of advertising, whereas Tesla would rather invest advertising dollars into improving and innovating the product. Neo like to compare everything they do to Tesla, except when they do that, it's comparing Tesla's technology from two years ago with what Neo's technology will become in two years time. Not really a fair comparison, but most people don't really notice. But once it becomes more known how successful Tesla is, how much demand there is, and what level of profit Tesla are able to produce, then you can bet the rivalry will start heating up. Although, I suspect by that time, it might just be a little bit too late. Thanks for listening, everyone. Please hit the thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe.